you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. The Iron Lady sings that makes it official. Welcome to the big show. Thanks for tuning in, as always. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. Be sure to check out our recent interview with one of the tech billionaires last week. Of course, we always have the CEOs, the billionaires, the astronauts, the Pulitzer Prize winners, the White House advisors, all the great people who write the most amazing books that share with you the life stories, the epicness of what they've learned, the cathartic moments they've been through. Basically... Stories are the owner's manual to life, and we have the, some of the greatest stories on The Chris Foss Show. And if you can't find anything you like on The Chris Foss Show, there's nearly 2,000 episodes. Well, you're boring as F. Anyway, that was insulting, wasn't it? Anyway, we have an amazing author on the show. We love you anyway. Everyone knows The Chris Foss Show family is a family that loves you but doesn't judge you. <laughs> Maybe the, if you're evil, we do. And, you know, if you're a very evil person, we do. Good. Judge I you. feel at home here then. Yeah. <laughs> The evil part or the no 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 <laughs> there's good folks that we're in go. we're in good company there you go we don't allow putin to uh, tune in yeah. so. we have the author we have the author of the newest book that's come out coming out actually april 2nd 2024 which i believe is the day after april fool's day so you're not gonna be fooled by this book because it's not coming out april 1st it's coming out april 2nd i just want to make that clear i don't know why but it's not funny <laughs> in my head her book is entitled Never Leave the Dogs Behind, a memoir by Brianna Mattia. She joins us on the show, and she's going to be talking. This is, I believe, her second book, and uh, she's going to be talking about why dogs are so damned important and uh, other things. But I figured I'd lead off with that because I'm also a dog person. Brianna has lived a life of relentless intention, traveling the deserts of the American Southwest in an old Ford van. We'll find out why she hates Chevys. She made a name for herself on social media with her inspiring captions, her essays about bravery, identity, nature, and subverting expectations, and why she hates being around other people. She lives in Utah with her four dogs, and we're actually in Utah right now filming this. Normally we're in Vegas. And Nowhere for Very Long is her first book. Welcome to the show, Brianna. How are you? So good. So glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Give us your dot coms. Where do you want people to find you on the interwebs? So briannamedia.com. Every both my all the information for both my books are on there. On Instagram, I'm just Brianna Media. Look for a big orange van. <laughs> You'll find me. Yeah. There you go. What was the big I think it's called the Big Bertha or what's Bertha. It's, yeah, Bertha. <laughs> he is still, as we speak, giving me problems. She will be she is always gonna be an old finicky lady, I tell you what. There you but go. We well, love her. <laughs> there you go. And it's it's a big orange van too. It's, as well. She's. She, I think one of the most common things that people tell me when they see Bertha in person is that she is way bigger than they thought. Mm. And I think people don't realize that I'm five ten. Mm -hmm. So in the pictures, like this, her tire is up to my hip. Wow. And I and I so I don't I don't think people realize she is monstrous. I love yeah. her. It's so fun to drive. <laughs> I also get that comment a lot when people meet me. They're like, wow, you're much bigger than we thought. So <laughs> give us a 30,000 overview, Rihanna, of your book. And I think, do we get a link to your website? Yeah, we did. You mentioned Instagram stuff. Give us a 30,000 overview of your book and what's inside. I mean, in short, it's the story of how my dogs were really the only reason that I survived the darkest period in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and that period involved going through a very public divorce because of my status on Instagram, which was very shocking to me, not expected at all. My very first book was kind of this happy, lovely desert story. And I never imagined that my second book would be about the crash and burn almost oh, of wow. that story. So the crash and burn book. Mm -hmm. That's why I, that's, uh, that, that, I should focus that on my sec, second book. Then my first book was kind of <laughs> happy. Here's my stupid stories. And then yeah. <laughs> maybe I should put all the crash and burn. Like here's all the, is, here's all the things I fucked up. Yeah. It's very cathartic and I am yeah. not afraid to say the stuff that I did wrong. I mean, and I, t I tell a lot of truths 
Mm-hmm. I don't paint myself out to be a hero. I don't really believe there's any just full on. I mean, rarely is there just an outright hero in the story, mm-hmm. uh, especially when you're talking about the ending of a marriage and, and you know, these decisions I made about my public figureness on social media. You know, there was it was messy. Mm-hmm. It was during covid I moved out to the desert. I bought nine acres of undeveloped land, (laughs) lived in a trailer that had no running water, no temperature control, like basically my van, but bigger, just sort of, yeah. You really don't like other people, do you? No, I'm just kidding. Not anymore. Not anymore. Not after all that. (laughs) It's, it's a strange departure too, because I grew up 45 minutes outside New York city. So I grew up, packed in with with people and i think that that's why i love my current environment so much more because i just feel like i can breathe out there but yeah this this book was i sort of i talk about i was walking the line between independence and isolation so it's great to be able to spend time on your own i I prescribe solitude to everybody. I think it's very healthy and should be super sought after. Yeah. But as soon as you are like starting to actually become afraid, like I really went full hermit up there for a while. It's like wild eyed woman in the bush. So yeah. Explains my first 10 marriages. Uh, <laughs> wild eyed women in the bush. I don't know. I think that's an OnlyFans <laughs> channel I subscribe to. I was going to uh, say that some, someone's going to do something fun There's with a that. joke somewhere there. That's going to end up clipped on TikTok. The, uh, <laughs> so so let's get a little into your history and then we'll circle back to the book. Tell us about your, your upbringing, what shaped you, her, her, who hurt you. I'm just kidding. Uh, How did you end up in this van driving around places? So I grew up in Connecticut, a middle-class Connecticut, and right on the line between a very, very wealthy town and a very, very poor town. And this particular area is actually used to study wealth disparity because it is so stark. You could drive down my street, take a right, there'd be like caution tape from a drive-by shooting. You could drive down my street and take a left, and there would be like million-dollar waterfront mansions. Wow. And it was... My mother, bless her, I love her, she's my best friend, but she very much wanted to live on the waterfront mansion side of town. Mm -hmm. So I just sort of grew up and started resenting this very like materialistic lifestyle and this very, you are going to grow up, go to school, go to college, get married, buy a house, have kids, work until you retire, and then hope you're well enough to go out and see the world. That was how, that, that was exhausting. the message. Yeah. I'm exhausted just you describing I say, it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even after saying the sentence, I'm like, yeah, yeah it's, yeah, it's, and it was just never appealing to me. And I, and mm-hmm. I just, I felt like nobody around me, even my age from a very young age, I felt like I was looking around and be like, you guys, are you guys buying this shit? Think, do you think that it was because you could so starkly see Yes. The, the differences, you know, some people they're kind of, you know, they might be born the silver spoon in their mouth and, you know, they're building yeah. opulence and stuff. You know, some of us were born in, you know, the average sort of environment yeah. or maybe lower average. Um, yeah. But you, you could see that because it was so close together. And you yeah. Could, you compare the two in your head and just go. And I used to call it like the real world. That felt more. I mean, that's not to say, of course, people who have money are not. I mean, you know, we're all complex human <laughs> beings, but It just felt more like this is what most people on the planet, like not most people are struggling and grinding and hustling and, you know, trying to do their best by their families. And it just felt like that was more human. Yeah. And I also was just always so drawn to people who didn't feel the need to hide everything. It's like, you know, I grew up as very cliche. It was like, The Chardonnay daytime mom with the dad who's gone at work and off with the secretary. Like, truly, it was like living in like a like some sort of a simulation. I mean, they filmed Stepford Wives in Connecticut, you know. <laughs> so you can kind of probably see the bullshit, you know, the yes. behind the facade of Yes. Uh, yeah. And I I did for as long as I can remember. And I'm not sure exactly where that comes from. My mom mm-hmm. still lives there to this day. Uh, But yeah, I took off. I went to college, 
graduated and didn't have anywhere to go because, you know, I didn't have a childhood bedroom to go back to. My parents were divorced. My mom was renting a room from someone. Mm -hmm. So I ended up, my boyfriend at the time who would become my husband, we lived on a 33 foot sailboat that was just docked. Like we rarely took it out. Yeah. And it sounds glamorous, right? Like you picture like deck hands, doing it, yeah. like white suit. It was 33 feet long. It had like a triangle mattress in the front. And it was no again, no running water, no air conditioning. <laughs> we had like a cooler that had just like beer and you know leftover pizza in it. It was bare bones. And I had never lived like that in my life. I had never had to figure out where am I gonna get my water. Or how am I going to keep me and my dog from boiling to death today? And I started to feel like that was a more intentional, present way to live. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of started choosing struggle a little Mm -hmm. bit. Like I got very comfortable in situations that were made me like I had to be malleable and adaptable. Mm -hmm. And that sort of made me feel safer. If I can... I mean, I've lived in a van, I've lived on a sailboat, I've lived in a trailer, (laughs) you know, I mean, I've lived on friends' couches, and it sort of makes you realize, like, how strong and capable you are, and I think most people would be surprised at how capable they are. It's just, we we don't- We used to have to do that as a species for, like, eons of time, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's only until recently you have running water and toilets and stuff. I know. The toilet thing is the big issue for me. I I imagine on a boat. Well, do you have gray water on a boat or? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. We used yeah. to own a Thunderbird back in the day from the sixties and it just dropped right in the lake, but that nice. was the sixties. Yeah. So, so let me, let me get this timeline straight. You've been married once, right? Yes. Twice. Okay. Once. So you did the sailboat after you did the, the van experience and excursion that you wrote about in your first book? No. So the sailboat okay. led to the van. Oh, so okay. this is, yeah. So the sailboat was the very first kind of introduction into i guess what i felt was like the more the real world and i fell and at first i moved on to that sailboat like i say in my first book i don't know that i would have chosen to do that if i had had another choice but i had like 800 bucks to my name i already had a dog of course is the first thing i did when i graduated from college was get my own dog And so I was really struggling to find anywhere else to go. And uh, so we, we found this sailboat Mm -hmm. uh, and just lived on it. And we were there for eight months and then hurricane Sandy hit the East coast. And so we evacuated and, and, you know, our our boat was spared, but by then we were kind of like ready to move on. So Mm -hmm. we quite literally just looked at a map and settled on Salt Lake City. And back then, like now, everybody knows Salt Utah is pretty cool, right? They did a great job with their marketing campaign. The five national parks, Salt Lake City's yeah. amazing skiing. But in 2012, nobody thought it was so cool that we were moving to Utah. They were like, are you going out to get some extra wives? Like, yeah. Where are you going to find beer? <laughs> like the whole the usual. And it was, it was a culture shock when we got out there, but we had sort of read that it was affordable. And so, yeah, we got this like 400 square foot studio apartment and just fell in love with the outdoors, fell in love with going down to the desert. And uh, that's when we bought the van and moved into the van. Yeah. And that was several really, really wonderful years that then culminated in a tragedy with one of my dogs who is thankfully still here, but my ex-husband accidentally ran him over. Oh boy. Yeah. And it was the single, I think about it often that it was a split second and it, my life went, my life will never be the same. Mm -hmm. I think that had a huge part in my divorce. Really? Like it really, it was, And I never blamed him. We never blamed each other, but it, it just, and then when you're a public figure 
on yeah. social media, it was like, here I had shown everybody this, my dog, he's amazing, I love him. I force strangers to look at pictures of him all the time. <laughs> and he's hurt and all of these people on social media love this dog. What am I supposed to not tell them? And so I, that was the first time that I started having this very conflicted relationship with social media wow. because it's fun to tell everybody the good stuff. all the nice stuff. Yeah. Yeah, all the and then all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, I'm in deep here. Like I've already told, no wonder these people are curious, you know, like I have to be self-aware enough to know that I'm on, I'm on social media. Of course people are curious, but it just, it changed my whole life. He lived on the floor or I lived on the floor of the vet hospital for 31 days. Oh, wow. It was tremendously expensive. Yeah, it was uh, worth it. He's still yeah. here. That's this happened good. when he was six. He's 12. So nice. yeah, he's, nice. he is a legend, an absolute legend. I mean, the real amazing story is the fact that he survived that mm -hmm. because it was six hours until we actually got him to a hospital because oh, wow. we were out in the desert the way we always yeah. were, you know, yeah. we were way out there yeah. and he survived against every single odd. So wow. yeah, he's my hero for That's sure. That's awesome. Six years. That is so yeah. great. Yeah. The, uh, that, 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 I mean, that's one of the things you worry about as a dog owner, us both being dog owners. So does part of your memoir, you know, you talk about how you were living this public life on Instagram, you have a public marriage and I've seen a lot of this with YouTube and different public marriages that we've seen. And then, and then all of a sudden, you know, they do the video where, like, Hey, we're separating. And yeah. then you start, you know, then sometimes buzz slings or sometimes, you know, you just start finding out stuff. So yeah. Do you talk about that in the book? And what is that like if you did? Yes. I talk about it pretty immediately. I kind of kick off with that, <laughs> honestly. But you don't have to get far in if you want to. Right into it. Yeah. Yeah, it was bizarre to be thrust into, like, my divorce was, you know, the accident with my dog was very publicly discussed. So I was sort of used to drama about my life being discussed. But I, in my mind, am not famous. I, I cannot bring myself to think that way. I just, mm -hmm. to me, famous people are like Beyonce. I am a lady who posts photos of her dog on the internet. So the idea that, that my divorce would be like news and fodder for entertainment and like oh. gossip was shocking dehumanizing you feel yeah. like you become a completely two-dimensional person yeah. people think that it's not going to affect you somehow if you're a public figure you no longer have feelings yeah. i'm a memoirist i bleed for a living like i like i am going to be deeply affected by this kind of stuff and you, um, you have a uh, 303,000 followers on instagram so yeah. you have your fair share of trolls and People that uh, oh, yeah. are tactful, I suppose. Yeah. Would be the way to say it. Yeah. Uh, people that are going to do conspiracy theories and judgments mm -hmm. and I don't know, yeah. blame, blame you for, blame you for uh, what are those sky trails in the sky and stuff, you know? Oh, chemtrails. Chemtrails. And yeah. they're going to blame you for JFK's murder oh, yeah. and everything, you know? Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. And they, I think, I mean, unfortunately, I never wanted to write a, as much about the negative side of social media that mm -hmm. I, that I have, that I have, mm -hmm. but these people made it my story. And so during this period of my life where I'm just getting divorced, I didn't know how to, I didn't feel like I was famous enough to post, you know, the screenshot of the note or leave, thank you for your privacy at this time. Like <laughs> that never occurred to me. And I was kind of just like, leave me alone. Which again, you know, in retrospect, it's what do you expect when you tell everybody everything? But what I didn't expect was how callous people were. Oh. Like, I don't, I don't know if people understand, like when you comment something on my photo, mm -hmm. I can see it. <laughs> the, the notification comes to my phone. I don't have an assistant. Mm -hmm. I don't have a, a social, like it's me. You're talking to me. Mm -hmm. And people would tag their, they'd scroll back and tag their friend under like an old photo of me and my ex-husband like kissing and be like, oh my God, I think they split up. I haven't seen the husband in a while. And I'm like, like I wrote this in my second book. It's kind of like somebody coming up and tapping you on the shoulder and then talking right through you, mm -hmm. gossiping right through you. But like, 
they made sure to like let you know first. Yeah, you're like, and I'm I, standing right here. Yes, exactly. And I don't think people realize that. And that's kind of like why I ended up talking about it so much in this book, because I was like, maybe people just don't have a full account of what it's like on this side. So I'm just going to be honest about it because I don't think there is anything like I don't I don't find strength in ignoring something or oh, I'm just going to I I feel like I hate that message because people say that it's so much easier said than done and I felt like such a failure when I couldn't ignore it. So it's like not only am I being harassed, stalked, losing sponsorships, being publicly defamed, having book events canceled. Wow. Oh yeah. Like wow. it went it went over the top. It was an absolutely wild experience. And I just, you know, I didn't want to act like it didn't hurt me and crush me and like permanently probably alter my mental health. Mm -hmm. Like I will always have leftover fears and paranoias and triggers from that experience. Wow. And for what? Like for what? I, I just... It's so weird to me that we have, it's a hobby, a totally acceptable hobby in our culture that a certain group of people, we can just annihilate them. Yeah. Well, they're public. What did you expect? Sure. We expected a little criticism. I didn't expect to be like, <laughs> tell people to have people tell me I should be killing myself. That's a bit much. Yeah. You know? And, and so I'm like, it's so weird that we just think there's a separate group of people that we can dehumanize. But in my mind, if you can dehumanize one person, you can dehumanize anybody. It's true. And you true. know, and, and the, uh, you know, I had, I had somebody, you know, we used to do a lot of tech reviews of products back in the day. And, and, you know, I got used to YouTube really on with the trolls and, and, you know, when you're making money off the, off the comments and the trolls and the views, you're kind of like, well, you just paid a dollar to, yeah. you know, just throw, wing shit at me so it's so true but i did have one person say to me he goes this review is so bad and it was like i don't know some 20 dollar piece of crap junk thing yeah. he goes this review is so bad you should kill yourself and i remember thinking the value of of someone's life is dependent upon the quality of a 30 dollar item on yeah like, and you damn. never know who you're talking to you never uh, know what kind of day they've had you never yeah. know what is gonna i just we 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 tend to like violently crash into each other all all day mm -hmm. you know and it's like you can be gentle with people because you really just never know yeah. what's going on you know but a lot of movie stars have that and i think a lot of people in fame and instagram and online have that where they become what you mentioned two-dimensional yeah and they don't they either see us at what their interpretation of us is or you know, if I ever went up to Al Pacino, I'd probably start doing Godfather references, and he'd just be like, "It was a movie I did a long time ago." Like, leave me alone. Uh, he'd probably ask for security. Uh, you know, I mean, w we've had people run up to me at shows and scream, "The Chris Voss Show!" And you're yeah. just you panic a little bit. You're like, "Okay," and you know, they think that you, you have a relationship with them because they watched you for years, and you're like, "I don't know who you are," but yeah, good for you. I love you. I love fans, but security. Yeah. So, yeah. It's really, a, it's a weird place to be with fame or semi-fame or however you want to categorize it, whatever way that people see you as a two-dimensional character. Alex brings up a great point. Hey, Alex, how you doing? What are some things you did for self-care to get through? Hi, Alex. I did a lot of breaks from social media. I did, I mean, my dogs were my constant source of self-care. One thing that was tremendously helpful was my property that I bought. I didn't have any cell service up there. So it was wow. like the definition of my safe bubble. It was like sliding back into the warm water, you know. And so that saved me for sure because I would have continued down the rabbit hole, you know. Once you start, it's hard to stop. That and also just I'm so lucky to have lifelong friends who yeah. remind me who sadly had to spend a lot of time reminding me that I was not a monster mm -hmm. because you start to question yourself. You know, you start to think if so many people hate me, mm -hmm. which so many people, meanwhile, it's like a dozen people who make a hundred accounts, but anyways, <laughs> you know, it's like the, the level of dedication, yeah. you start to think I must deserve this. This is 
why, if I truly have done nothing wrong, why is anyone doing this to me? And the fact is, you know, they're illogical. And you, so you're never going to find a logical reason. Yeah. But for a while I had to lean on friends and family big time to sort of just like talk. I mean, I would be like hyperventilating. They'd be like, you're okay. Like listing out things in my life that I had done that were good. Yeah. Like, it, and it's, I mean, I was really beaten down to a pulp. So yeah, stepping away from it. I mean, I make sure I make it a point to take at least two months intermittently, mm -hmm. um, collectively off of Instagram a year. Uh, <laughs> and here you live off it. Are you? I yeah. Mean, I don't know if you well, it and it's, yeah, it's usually timed like when maybe my book is there doing you okay. But yeah, you know. Just plugs in there. It's worth it though. There's no amount of money that is worth me being, you oh, know, yeah. just totally burnt out. And I think so many creators are so burnt out because so many people are just mean and they just crush people's spirit just to do it. Did you have and people that took the sides? Like sometimes people yes. take sides. So they're like, mm -hmm. Oh, that they go with the other person and then, mm -hmm. and then they're, well, they're throwing shit at you. You know, what is wild to think about? And I would be surprised if any of these people had ever considered this. My ex-husband did not participate in social media really at all. He had a page but he would post like one photo every five months, kind of like a typical guy, right? Yeah. So everything, all of the real information was on my page, meaning I told these people who he was. There's Banjo. And if you think about that, Bertie, quit. These people base their opinion on what I told them and then decided to team up on his it's like i painted a picture i painted this character for them right because you can never fully you can never fully you know know who somebody is and so the fact that after all of that they were all like team keith is his real name even though i i went birdie quit it is I, the book is entitled folks never leave the dogs behind so we have to get some really i have not that's they're part, here that's part of the it's part of the come whole here. memoir so if you want what else what else is in the memoir because i don't want to turn this into the i don't want oh, to focus yeah. too much on this unless unless that's the whole book but i imagine no 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 it's um it's really it's a lot i mean it's a lot of me burning bridges and <laughs> totally ha i mean i actually <laughs> I wrote in there, you you tend to burn a lot of bridges when you yourself are on fire. Oh, that's true. I was on fire, mm -hmm. just mentally, I was at a loss. I had been with my ex-husband for 11 years. Mm -hmm. Now we were divorced. He's on out there making dating profiles. Part starts, he starts to participate in the online hate. Really? He and his family. So I was just at this terribly low point. I didn't trust people. I started kind of burning down all of my new friendships in this little town. It was COVID. So yeah, that was stressful for everybody. Yeah. Toss that in. It's not like anybody was having a great year in 2020. That's for sure. But yeah, I retreat to the desert. I found this nine acres of property and I went up there on my own and I bought it on my own and I have since paid it off on my own. And it was sort of strange to accomplish this incredible goal while being like, I am dying, like every day fighting for my emotional life, mm -hmm. trying to process that this property was our dream. My ex-husband and I always said we were oh, going to really? do it together. Mm -hmm. So now I'm out here divorced, confused, isolated, but I have this property of my dreams. And so mm -hmm. it kind of was a turning point for me. And I started to feel capable mm -hmm. and like, I started to see what my life could be like on my own and, and this, this ultimate freedom. And then I drove down to, to Baja with my dogs for six weeks, which my, just me and my dogs, least favorite thing. My mom, my mom says it's the least favorite thing, her least favorite thing I've ever done. She did not like that at all. She was worried about your safety, maybe in Mexico? Or? Yeah, and I don't speak a whole lot of Spanish. I tend to, I'm very impulsive, spontaneous, but I think impulsive is a little bit more accurate because it doesn't always end well. But yeah, I drove down to Baja and it was great. It was like one of the yeah. best things I ever did.
Yeah. And all along through this ride, my dogs were with me. I mean, I would meet a guy maybe and go home with him and my dogs would be with me like in the, <laughs> like they were constantly with, I was never apart from them. And so to have these highs and lows and these really wonderful things happening in your life mixed in with these horrible things, there is no support system like a dog in that regard because they love you exactly the same on your best days and on your worst days. Yeah. Didn't matter if I was crying happy tears or sad tears. They were rushing to me to offer comfort. Oh, and they and know like, too when you're, yeah. you're oh somewhere. absolutely. Yeah. 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 If I were to start crying, this one right here would be you her little face would appear. <laughs> she gets very nervous when I cry. <laughs> Well, Which was a lot. <laughs> so never leave the dogs behind. And I imagine part of the story there is the unconditional love of dogs and how much of a, a wonderful comfort they can be. You know, it, it, going through a divorce is hard because it's the death of it's the death of so many dreams and, and people put into it. And the longer it is, the longer it takes to unpack all that yeah. and go through the grieving stage. Yep. And then you're tying that also to the social media fame. That just makes everything harder. Yeah. Um, but maybe that's why I haven't ever gotten married. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and I'm engaged I, to this absolutely lovely, wonderful man, but I think we'll probably just be engaged forever. Yeah, We're not having private. kids. We don't. Don't tell yeah. anyone. I honestly, that has been a blessing that I get to change that about my social media. People go. know more about my fiance's relationship with one of my dogs because they're buds. He stole yeah. them from me, basically. Uh -oh. Then they do about us because I lesson learned. Some things are just go. best kept more personal. So, there you go. Yeah. so any final tease outs on the book that you want to throw out before we go? <sighs> I think that it will be surprisingly relatable, even if you have never lived in an off-grid trailer with four dogs and two pythons on nine acres of desert. Two um, pythons, too? Yeah, they were, yeah, Bean and May. They're actually right over there. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I love animals. I'm, I'm just so comforted by them. You and need I a think, zoo. No, yeah. I don't know what you Maybe. said at the beginning of the episode. That's yeah. my goal too. I'm just going to fill that property with animals. I want an indoor outdoor alpaca. I think that would be great. There you go. And I just want like a like an alpaca shaped dog door. <laughs> yeah. Then you can get the fur and, you know. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, it is I'm really proud of it. It's deeply deeply vulnerable and honest. It is the most honest I've ever been, but I hope it encourages other people to be honest because that's where all of our commonalities lie yeah. in the messy parts of our lives. And mm -hmm. I also hope that it kind of shows people what's survivable because mm -hmm. I was on the brink truly in every sense of the word. And I'm sitting here today talking to you live about it. Didn't think I would survive it. Four years later, here I am. So I hope that it inspires people to just kind of push through. There's something on the other side. There's always there something on the other side. What a great story and what a great lesson. I mean, the push through. I mean, we go through these darkest moments of life, and that's why we say stories are the lessons, the owner's manual to life, is because, you know, when when they hear stories like yours, people realize they're not alone, that other yeah. people have gone through the darkest moments they never thought they were going to go through. And so just everybody go buy nine acres in the desert next yeah. time you're having a hard time. Yeah, you but you know exactly. what, what that speaks to is there is a time where you need to spend time alone and you need yeah. to do some healing or what we call doing the work where you need to, you know, you need to process the grief. You need to go through those steps. Yeah. Um, you need to find yourself again yes. and redevelop who, who am I now? You know, because right. uh, I mean, I see this with a lot of people are married cause I dated a lot of divorced people. That's pretty much all I date nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it's, it's hard at this age to find people that have been married once or twice, but, but you know, they've got to figure out who they are because that marriage was an identity. Yes. So now that that's gone, they have to reestablish a new. So it's it's a good analogy, and I think I meet a lot of divorced people that need to go out in the desert for a while. Oh yeah, um, I and, I'm telling you, I prescribe <laughs> solitude to people. It's yeah. very oh. uncomfortable at first. But once you get comfortable with, with it, right? Once you get comfortable with it, you're you're addicted to. It. I love yeah. being alone. My yeah. plans tonight are to be entirely alone and hang out with the dogs and watch a crime show or something. I can't wait. <laughs> there you go. There yeah, you 
But yeah. never leave the dogs behind because they're, I mean, they're, they're just the best unconditional love you can ever find in this world. And my dogs have changed my life and made me a better yeah. human in so many ways. I, I'm still a horrible human. Don't get me wrong, but I used to. We all have our moments. Which is, which is hard to imagine. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brianna, for coming to the show. Give us your dot coms for people to find you yep. on the interwebs. It is BriannaMedia.com, B-R-I-A-N-N-A-M-A-D-I-A, and uh, same name on Instagram. So there you go. Just look for a lot of dogs. <laughs> yeah, she's got 303,000 followers over there and a lot of cool pictures. I love the uh, the journeys you're going on, like some of the pictures of some of the environments you're in. Utah yeah. has such great, you know, there's so many different places to go here as yeah. long as you don't go anywhere near there's, there's people. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Go, Down. go, wherever you go, just go away from my place. No, <laughs> The, there you go. There you go. So you're not building a commune yet. At the no, right. but I have some friends. I have some friends who are like, when stuff hits the fan, we know yeah. where we're coming. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I'll call you on the next COVID run. Yeah. Because I may want to escape everything like I did Seriously. the first time. So there you go. So thank you for coming on the show. Thanks to our audience for tuning in. Go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, all those crazy places on the internet. Order up where refined books are sold. You can pre order it now. It's available April 2nd, 2024. Never leave the dogs behind. A memoir. Please never do that. And do not lock them in the backyard and forget about them. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time.